Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion today on the topic of education systems innovation. Uh, we're very grateful to have Zach Stein with us today to discuss this topic. So uh, first of all, big thank you, Zach, for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, so just to introduce Zach, uh, so Zach is a philosopher of, of education uh, with a background in meta theory, integral theory, development psychology and psychometrics. And um, Zach did his work in education and psychometrics at Harvard with Howard Gardner, who, as some of you may know, uh, is well known for his theory of multiple intelligences, which, um, you know, in, in many ways has, has advanced how we think about intelligence today. Um, and Zach has also worked with Kurt Fisher uh, on uh, advanced developmental psychology and has written books on the topic of education, including his most recent uh, book, uh, which is Education in a Time Between Worlds. Um, and co-hosting this discussion today, we have Mikhail Sampala, who's the content partner uh, at Systems Innovation, as well as myself, Bowen Feng, the community manager at Systems Innovation. Um, and so today's discussion will last for uh, an hour and it will include around 10 minutes or so at the end for audience questions. Uh, so please do post any questions that you might have on the YouTube comment stream and we'll aim to uh, get round to them at the end and we'll um, put them forward to Zach. So um, I think to, to, to start off uh, quoting Nelson Mandela, um, he once said that education is the most powerful weapon from which you can use to change the world. Yeah, it's interesting that when we look at the history of education, that actually we've seen remarkably little change, most would argue, um, even going back to um, Shakespeare's times or arguably even further. Um, and yet there's this kind of, we could say rigidity in, the, in, in this institution, yet there's been so many changes around it, whether that's societal transformations or technological transformations. Um, and, and on that thread, it's, it's, you know, not always useful to talk about education in isolation, um, because, of course, it is a system that is very embedded in this context, in its wider context. And, of course, it needs to adapt to its environment in order to be useful and ultimately successful. Um, and one of the important questions, um, I think, in education seems to be that, you know, if one or if one of the primary goals of education is to prepare students for the future, and maybe this is something we could even, you know, discuss in the in the in the session to what extent we agree with that. But if this is so, how do we prepare them for a future that we aren't able to predict, and arguably are increasingly unable to predict? Um, and and so I, I think this is one reason it's so great to have a uh, Uzak here with us to discuss this today, and I want to thank Mikel here as well for, for just suggesting we invite uh, Zach to discuss this, because, because Zach, he seems to be somebody who is not only obviously very much steeped in the field of education, I mean, you've, you've written and, and researched extensively on the subject, um, but you're also somebody who's put um, a lot of thought into kind of the, the wider context, and in, in many ways, kind of the, the societal transformations and, and tipping points that we are experiencing or going through. And of course, this is something that's very relevant today. Um, and also have thought about how these changes um, maybe should or, or will shape education and, and education's role in society. Um, and so on that note, maybe to, to kick off then, uh, for those in the audience, Zach, that might not be uh, that familiar with your work, um, just for you to kind of yeah, talk a bit about your own uh, relationship with this topic and maybe what kind of intrigues you so much about the field of education. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I came to education from philosophy and developmental psychology and essentially realized that very much in line with the Nelson Mandela quote, that if you really look carefully at the fields in the social sciences, you know, sociology, anthropology, psychology, <clears throat> a lot of what you end up looking at is <clears throat> the nature of intergenerational transmission, right? That so much of what we call human culture and eventually what we have as civilization uh, is completely dependent upon continuity in 
processes of intergenerational transmission, which is another way of saying it all hinges on this problem of education. Uh, in my book, I quote John Dewey, who said all the problems of philosophy can be brought to a head in the problem of education. Which, think about it. Education includes political, epistemological, ethical, metaphysical, and psychological problems all rolled into one. And so yeah, I became fascinated by it as an interdisciplinary challenge and then also captivated by it as a place to put energy as kind of like a fulcrum that and kind of like a lever that it's actually the the central node in a very complex set of causal cascades so i, I came to see that's the the linchpin um and then within education i started looking for linchpins right so if, if education is a linchpin of a culture it's like the key catalyst of change uh then with, if you could find the linchpin within the linchpin <laughs> then you found something so that's why i focused first on standard mass testing because uh, at least in the united states there was no talking about education reform in any kind of like realistic sense unless you were going to start grappling with the high stakes standardized testing infrastructure that was used to regulate the school system um so that's an example there and then in the new book i look at uh another linchpin within the linchpin, which is educational technology. And as you were mentioning, the broader socio-cultural, political, economic context in which educational configurations sit. Um, and so if those things shift a lot as they are, then the nature of schooling itself needs to change. And you mentioned that we haven't changed much. And in one sense, that's absolutely true. We're like long overdue for change. And the last time there was a very kind of radical reconfiguration of education as comparable to the one we're facing now happened like the end of the long 16th century when we came out of pre-modernity and into modernity, when we ran the 30 years war gauntlet between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And on the other side, we came with modern quote unquote institutions, which including the things that we know of as school with universalistic ambitions and every child and graded classrooms and printed textbooks and these things. That was a major change. But then once that was set in, we've kind of tried to perfect that model of modern schooling for 300 years, 400 years <laughs> after World War II, uh, and especially after 1972, the most sophisticated educators became aware of what you mentioned, which was that, wait a second, we can't predict the future anymore. Or it's not even that we can't predict the future, it's that we have way too good reason to believe that the future will be very different than it is now. Whereas previous societies, especially pre-modern societies, you know, basically you grew up in a society that was more or less like your father's, which was more or less like your grandfather's, which was more or less like his father, right? That there was intergenerational transmission within the context of relatively stable meta social patterns, right? But when these larger patterns start to shift and then you become aware that they're shifting, then, and you're an educator, you're thinking, wait, you know, we're like sending these kids out of the system towards a target. Right, like, oh, they'll land in that position, they'll land in that family and happy situation, they'll land in that job. But if those targets are now moving very rapidly or just instantly disappearing, right, and new ones are appear, like if that's happening, then you have to think about education very differently. That was a major shift in 72, and particularly with the publication of the Limits to Growth, uh, which basically said, listen, the current the meta social pattern of the capitalist world system cannot continue in perpetuity indefinitely <laughs> because it's extracting with an infinite kind of ambition on a finite material basis, which is to say you can't keep preying upon the earth endlessly without consequence. There are limits to growth. So that was one of the key things that signaled in the educational space. Uh oh, <laughs> we can't be training everyone to be, you know, next level, great, awesome participants in the capitalist world system because that thing's about to grind to a halt. Uh, and so the idea of education and time between worlds in my book is just that notion 
And this comes from Wallerstein's world system analysis, which is based in Prigogine, which ultimately gets into complex dynamical systems, that the world system was an equilibrated functioning model for a while uh, with a lot of externalities, but there was an equilibrium there to a certain extent, a homeoresis, a direction of growth and autopoiesis. But like any complex system, you can reach a point of catastrophic bifurcation when the normal patterns of equilibrium are disrupted and all of a sudden things that used to be stable and reliable like temperature for example right it was 94 degrees in vermont yesterday these things that used to be stable and reliable are not and so the whole system when it comes undone and so between equilibrium states right is the idea now you can regress to a lower equilibrium state or you can reorganize to a higher order of equilibrium but you're not going to stay where you are and so this is the hypothesis in world systems analysis. Um, and uh, uh, again, limits to growth and other models suggested that we're actually right now at a planetary scale in a context of catastrophic bifurcation, which means that we are out of one equilibrium, but not yet in another equilibrium, which means we're between worlds. <clears throat> and so that's just like adds an exclamation point to your sentence that, wait, if we can't predict the future, how can we prepare kids for something? Um, and of course there's answers to that. Uh, and it's that, but, it has, but those have to do with changing really basic structures in educational systems. So I'll pause there, that was a lot. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I really kind of appreciated the, the historic view that you took and how, yeah, you know, there was a point where maybe things were arguably more stable and actually this, um, you know, educational system that was more um, systematic and kind of in a way produced more of a standardized output um, was maybe effective because it it was fairly good at matching up with the natural environment. But then you know, we, we reached and arguably we are reaching now, maybe in an even more amplified way, a, a point of potential verification, as you say, where, you know, things kind of break down in the environment and this kind of forces maybe, uh, I mean, as you say, can either fall back to normal, which may be suboptimal, given that the environment is new or even like an ultra adaptive response and kind of there's this no middle ground. Um, uh, I'm curious to maybe just to because of course we are going through quite unprecedented times right now um, are you able to elaborate maybe just briefly on what you see as the main structures that are changing in particular in relation of course to education which is obviously the center of gravity of this of this conversation um, just to, just add a bit, bit more of the context before we kind of go more into the you know the, the education uh, discussion Right. I mean, so when you look at that other period with the birth of modernity, the last time we had like a extremely radical change to the form of education itself, and we can talk about that period, but the printing press was involved. <laughs> the idea that uh, the printing press is in some ways responsible for the French Revolution itself and that you couldn't get anything like a modern school system without printing textbooks. Um, and so similarly, when I'm looking at this kind of change, I'm looking for something and it ends up being the digital, that one of the main things that we're seeing and the current situation with the pandemic where we've closed all the physical school buildings and set up this massive ad hoc digital infrastructure for schooling point directly to what was already taking place, which was that there was a major change in the underlying technology of education. As big from, I mean, you know, textbooks are as different from what's coming as they were from what preceded them, which were hand copied manuscripts, <laughs> uh, like precious, you know, non-reproducible, not mass producible, not easily translatable, et cetera. Uh, and so you're looking at a fundamental shift in the underlying technology behind education. And for a long time, we'd been like holding the modern notion and trying to like, like put the digital into it. 
like, oh, the, well, the, we'll just put computers in the schools, right? But it's still a school. It's still based on the basic notion of the, of the modern school. It's just now you have a digital thing in it. Or like, you know, the streaming video didactic instruction with a multiple choice test after, which is a lot of like what Khan Academy is, right? So it's like, mm, okay, but isn't that just what we've been doing in schools for so long? Didactic instruction with the multiple choice test, it can't be what the promise of the digital is. Nor can the promise of the digital just be an incredible encyclopedia. Like we had pretty incredible encyclopedias. Now they weren't Wikipedia, you know, uh, but back in the day, Encyclopedia Britannica. Anyway, so I'm just saying like, it can't just be that. So the question ends up being, you know, what are the real affordances of the digital as this new uh, kind of uh, technological uh, media underpinning uh, education? And I think we haven't seen it yet. I lay it out in my book and it has to do with the possibility of completely decentralizing uh, educational configurations and redistributing the dynamics of teacherly authority within community. Uh, and this is a, this is, so the, the best way to think about it is to think that what the digital does for us uh, is least well shown on a screen, right? So we confuse the digital and the capacity of the digital with experiences we can have looking at screens, right? It's mostly because the digital was captured by profit-seeking people who wanted to sell us advertisements. But when you look at the fundamental changes that are taking place in the world as a result of the digital, it's not that everyone's captured by the screen, although that's a huge deal. It has to do with things like, uh, you know, the Internet of Things, like massive real-world tracking digital infrastructures, huge measurement infra infrastructures that are, you know, have it so that cities are basically massive surveillance and data, data grabbing instruments, right? That most of what's valuable in the digital is its ability to have memory and very complex intercommunications. Um, so one way of thinking about what the digital school ends up being is not a school where everyone's staring at screens, right? But a city that's been turned into a school because the digital has allowed it to be a very complex time and skill sharing network, right? So imagine a bunch of people walking down the street in a city, right? It, as they're all walking by one another, there's a ton of potential teacher-student relationships, right? Like somebody walks by somebody who knows how to play piano, wanting to learn how to play piano, but they never get a chance to know that there's a potential teacher-student relationship there because it's not part of the basic kind of data infrastructure of the city. But you can imagine a la Ivan Illich in de-schooling society. And he tried to do this with like a, a message board, like a non-digital message board, like an actual, like a pin and a piece of paper on a bulletin board, <laughs> which I remember when I was a kid, we had those. But, uh, but the idea would be, yeah, part of what the digital allows for is everyone to, to have in a common ledger, you know, a docket of what they're interested in teaching what their skills are, their availability. And then another one that says, here's what I'm interested in learning and my availability. And you can have a distributed network of teacherly authority that is ended up brought together by the digital infrastructure, which enables like Uber, right? Like the main experience of Uber is the car, not the screen, <laughs> right? So the main experience of the digital future in education is not the screen, it's the fact that there's a pop-up classroom that just occurred, right? And the, the network curated exactly the right people in exactly the right place for a pop-up classroom to occur. Um, and so that's, that's the future. It's not the screen captures our attention and stops us from having teacher-student relationships. It's that the screen directs us away from it towards the right people to be in relationship with in an educational context. Um, and it is, uh, makes it so that the huge factory schools become obsolete. It even makes it so that the age graded um, segregation of kids, which is to say like bizarre modern practice, right? Of you only hang out with people who are basically exactly your same age for most of, for like the first 18 years of your life. Like that's just a rule, it's, like, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, so this allows actually for skill and interest pairing with attention to uh, 
potential teacher student relationships emerging within student cohorts, right? Mentors, um, intergenerational transmissions, as fine grain as you want it to be, not necessarily just the oldest people and the youngest people, you know, that the high schoolers can teach the middle schoolers who can teach the grade schoolers, right? That this is how it used to work. Um, and that the factory model and the limits of keeping track of this many kids in this huge building without digital <laughs> meant that we had to organize them in a certain way. Uh, so that's a little bit of what I'm speaking into, trying to say, wait, you now we've kind of taken a false start here with thinking about technology and education and got completely seduced into the screen and the affordances of the screen and trying to like repackage didactic education through the, the screen um, in the context of the school, which we take as a given. And I'm saying, well, if you take the school not as a given, but you take intergenerational transmission as this deep function within a city, then you change the problem. They do, oh, we need to figure out how to get <laughs> the right people interacting so that intergenerational, intergenerational transmission takes place in a way that we can help as an urban center. We can make this whole city into basically something like a school. Mm. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Um, and yeah, uh, Mikhail, curious if you, if you had any questions just to follow up on that. No, I, I think like I'm really interested in what what uh, Zach is talking about right now. So um, so um, he's describing this shift from this type of old physical world in which we were tied to, you know, the schools and the schooling, which meant that we had to, you know, first go to school and then after that we we went to work, and and there was a big big distinction between those. And I think like yeah, uh, I, I know a little bit more about your work and I think you're using the word education to refer to something that is more broader than just, you know, the school institutions. And it has to do with this lifelong learning and networked, um, networked nature of, of society. So do you want to add, add something to that? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, and that's in a sense why I keep using this term intergenerational transmission uh, because education gets confused with schooling and schooling gets confused with learning, uh, which is a huge problem <laughs> because a great deal of learning takes place outside of schools and schools represent only a small fraction of the educational activities of any given society. So there are these categories that are nested and education is very broad. You know, John Dewey believed that basically all the institutions of a society were educative that um, most of the basic infrastructures, uh, even, I mean, there are obvious ones like that the news is uh, educational, right? But Dewey would say even things like labor policy, uh, which affect the amount of time parents can spend with their kids, that, that these are educational. Uh, so really when I use the term education, I'm referring to something as broad as this term, intergenerational transmission, but it, education specifically a kind of reflective approach to securing and caring for intergenerational transmission, right? Which is to say that for as long as humans have had cultures and civilizations, there's been processes of socialization and intergenerational transmission. Education became a very uh, reflective practice a little bit later <laughs> in cultural evolution, a little bit more when we start to get things that we call civilizations. And part of what differentiates civilizations from one another and from, you know, non-civilized pre kind of archaic uh, anciency uh, has to do with the effort and attention given to education, to the reflective crafting and shaping of intergenerational transmission. Um, and so that's why when civilizations rise and fall, that's when you start to see different kinds of attention given to education. Um, so, such as, such as now. Yeah, um, it's fascinating. I, I find it very interesting, this, this, you know, how you really highlight this, this inter intergenerational um, transmission, as you say, and how, you know, in a way, it's kind of like you're redefining, you're, you're detaching education necessarily from the traditional concept of the teacher. 
it's not that that concept isn't valuable that you have somebody who you know who fits within that traditional mold but also that maybe in doing that and saying well teachers do the teaching that we're actually missing out on a lot of the teaching that can that we can maybe be more open to and maybe even in formalize maybe formalize is a bit of a dangerous word to use um but one thing i would maybe just uh one thing i could be interested to talk about here so we talked about changes in the environment but yet within this change changing environment education has stayed relatively static um i'm curious from your perspective zach what what would you say are some of the forces that may be leading to this this kind of rigidity? Do you feel it's something that might be also kind of breaking apart at the seams? Um, or do you, because it seems that in education we're reaching kind of this point where if it doesn't adapt, it's kind of like it will be forced to change or it just all, almost becomes in some ways maybe irrelevant in some factors. And I'm curious kind of how you see this playing out. And do you think that, education is going to step up to these changes that we're, that we're seeing. Uh, so a few things there. Uh, first I'll address the bit about teachers because this is an important point. Um, and so I use this term teacherly authority and it's important to get that uh, teacherly authority exists outside of institutionalized contexts, right? Um, that teacherly authority is an anthropologically deep seated aspect of human relationship, um, which is to say like <clears throat> at all times and all places when there are two humans together, there's a potential for the relationship to become one where I learn something from you and we both know that that's happening or you teach something to me and we both know that that's happening. And what's interesting about school is that it's in institutionalized contexts which confers teacherly authority by virtue of bureaucratic power, right? Not necessarily by virtue of actual skill differential and appropriateness of teacherly engagement, right? So this is just to say that um, when adolescents question the authority of the teacher, that's an interesting moment in any educational context, right? Uh, and when the potential for the, the kind of like authority of the state to come down through into the classroom <laughs> and be the authority of the teacher, right? And so there are all of these dynamics that have kind of confused us about, well, what is a teacher, right? Like what gives someone the authority to teach? to kind of like shape the way I think and to shape my mind. And how do I give over trust in someone to be a teacher to me? And because we've so confused, again, learning with schooling and education with schooling. And when you say, well, education adapt, I think you actually mean, well, schools adapt because education's happening everywhere. Education well, is part of the reason this is happening. It's just it's not schools necessarily are the reason that this is happening. So education gets confused with schools, learning gets confused with schools. Teacherly authority gets confused with teachers in schools, <laughs> uh, when in fact their authority is conferred by the state through bureaucratic power. Now, we've all experienced teachers who are obviously more smart and inspiring than us and who actually, we give them teacherly authority by virtue of demonstrated skill and capacity. Right, like that's the experience you want. That's why you love some teachers because though they're not just a teacher because the state tells me they're a teacher, right? Or, or, or the principal tells me I have to respect them. They're a teacher because they really know and they're able to teach and they're able to get me interested and like show me through their speech and their actions and their character that they are, you know, someone to be learning from. So that's, that's what I call legitimate teacherly authority when the relationships established with a teacher um, and it exists um, irrespective of institutionalized context. Uh, and um, so some of what I'm doing here is actually trying to get teacherly authority removed from confusion with this bureaucratic role of the teacher and say, no, teacherly authority is a aspect of human relationships that's there with, throughout the social world. And 
we need to find a way to like reinvigorate that at the community level. Um, and then once we have that working, then we can go back and look at the people who are institutionalized as teachers and get them another way of having their authority be conferred a more organic way, um, less dependent upon uh, the kind of centralized um, epistemic and, and power authority, which gets to your second point about like why the recalcitrance within the educational system. And so that's because the educational system has mostly been um, reacting to or shaped by broader economic interest that it has been, and this was again back to the end of the long 16th century, that was the birth of a capitalist world system. And so the dominant forces that set the whole agenda for that evolution of our civilization were the forces of capital. And that included capital shaping the nature of schooling in a very fundamental way. United States is a great example if you just look at the impact of private philanthropic money on public educational institutions becomes interesting equations. Diane Ravitch called the billionaires boys, the billionaire boys club does more to shape public education, even while they send their own kids to private school than any other force. Um, so in my book, I talk about uh, reductive human capital theory being the dominant meta theory or philosophy driving education in this period. And the basic idea is that, oh, what is education? Again, it's, they're, they're defining it out of this huge space. So I know education happens in schools and it's about this preparation of the next generation for entry into wage labor. That's what education is. So education is a sub-function of the economy and the function of the educational system is to produce the human capital that fills the economic system and gets the economic system running. Right. So we fix the schools to save the economy. This is the right. And how do we know the schools are working? Because everyone gets jobs. Right. Um, that kind of thing. Um, so that's been the dominant way of thinking about education. And it's, you know, God bless them. The capitalists wanted educated, healthy workers for a while. Right. So they really built some good schools. And so there was a time when there was a certain equilibrium. Right. Where there was actually the modern school was humming. It was working. It was kind of doing its thing. Um, but as we noted, right, that whole economic model, 1972 limits to growth, like, uh oh, started getting weird. <laughs> like no longer manufacturing in the United States, we move it out, but we have the big factory schools still. Uh -oh, right, so a sense that the economic base started to change even as the way of conceiving the function of education didn't really change. So the idea that we're still preparing kids for like a predictable job market where you're like, leave high school and get a job that prepares you to go to this thing. Then you get the graduate thing to go to get that job, but oops, that job doesn't exist anymore. Right. So that whole complex sets in and um, yeah, it complicates this question about human capital theory as the predominant way of understanding the function of the educational system. Um, so that's the broadest answer that ideologically there hasn't been an impetus to change. Um, uh, and then just, large complex systems are slow to change most of the time until the catastrophic bifurcation when they change very rapidly. <laughs> so we've, there's been just a lot of inertia within this way of thinking about schooling. And I could get into that because it's, again, because it's a linchpin, it's hooked into all the other systems. So it's hard to change education. Like um, we, tried to we tried to change standardized testing very radically we encountered opposition in some states where it was argued that if you change the standardized test, you'll also change real estate values. Now this is actually true, right? Like same house, same property, but different county, right? Different school system. One school system is better on the tests than the other. That house is worth way more. <laughs> if it's in a good school system, how do you know it's a good school system? Because of the test. Right? So if we start tinkering with the tests, all of a sudden houses that used to be worth more than other houses are now worth less than those houses because we revealed something different about the capacities within the school system. So you realize, oh, okay, it's hard to tinker with the schools because if you tinker with the schools, you're tinkering with real estate, you're tinkering with job markets, 
right? You're tinkering with access to the halls of power, right? One way up and into things like Congress and legal professions and medical professions, the kind of gated entry to the, to the elite, that's all educational. So when you start to mess with the educational system, you're messing again with the linchpin that holds a whole kind of civilizational complex together. Um, so that's the reason it's gonna be slow to change, but why when things really start to change, education becomes a kind of very dynamic um, kind of a liminal entity between worlds, put it that way. And, and there's a really interesting like relationship between learning. So um, if you think about the old schooling system, we're learning new skills to get to the workforce and our, our relevance is, you know, um, noted by the, those skills. And I think like, in a world which is um, characterized by this constant change or complexity, I think, I think maybe the goal of education is not learning new skills only, but there is a broader, broader, broader uh, goal there going on that is related to maybe human development and and how we are able to you know grasp these new situations and the bigger problems and and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the classic answer, and again, it's, it's the one that's been given since 72, right? It's the one that Abraham Maslow gave. I don't know if you guys know who, who Abraham Maslow is, great American psychologist. In his journals, he writes about just exactly this problem, that we've got schools that are built to put kids in jobs that are about to disappear. And he gives the answer, which is a great answer, which is that we can't have the schools be about specific facts and we can't have the schools be about specific routes into specific kind of wage labor positions that the schools should be about learning how to learn. It's, good. it's a simple answer. It's also the answer that Dewey gave, interestingly enough, because he saw this problem coming even back <laughs> in the 1890s, 1920s. Uh, when Dewey was so prolific, he was like, you know, well, how do you decide what is the right thing to learn when it's so complicated and contentious? And he was like, well, you want to learn those things that allow you to learn more. Like a simple answer. And you also say like, well, how much freedom do we give to the kids? Right. And he says, well, you give those freedoms that ensure greater future freedoms. <laughs> It's another good answer, <laughs> right? Because if you give so much freedom that the kid doesn't learn the ABCs, now you've just cut him off from a whole bunch of possible future freedoms. You've actually disabled him by giving him too much freedom. So you constrain freedom only in the interest of having more freedom enabled. And so similarly, you would focus learning, right? You would, you would learn certain things in order that you could learn more things later. And this is important to get because sometimes people think you learn something that you've learned it period like because you're preparing for a test <laughs> but in fact learning is always the staging ground for future learning so one way to think about the like meta curriculum of a future schooling is to step back from specifics and into a focus on uh, basically a curriculum about the nature of the self and the person right that the core of the meta curriculum is learning about your own learning, learning about the nature of individual agency and learning about the society you live in in which that agency exists um, so that you actually graduate with a kind of society-wide situational awareness and the ability to learn what you need to learn when you need to learn it and a self-understanding which tells you which kind of proclivities you have, which talents you have, which things you're attracted to, which things you're not attracted to, self-awareness so that you can do the right thing. No matter what that is, maybe that is getting a job, right? But maybe it's actually no taking something like a basic income and working with people who are homeless, right? Or caring for the sick, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that's gonna need doing. Uh, especially as more of the kind of like jobs get automated, then the things that need doing, which we've neglected doing because of our jobs, which should never be turned into jobs, things like caregiving and raising children, <laughs> uh, that these things can be done again. Uh, but we have to learn to do them because uh, we, we often don't know how to do them. So lifelong learning 
being the expected position of adulthood, as opposed to adulthood being like the period on the end of the sentence of your education, um, which is to say, oh, you've been educated, now you're an adult, hence the end of your education and the beginning of life, right? <laughs> is the way most people think about it, but it, it can't, it simply can't be that way. It needs to be that, oh, you've ended this kind of particular phase of your learning and you're now more mature and have more responsibilities, but society is very complicated. So we're gonna put you in a position to be able to have access to resources to continually learn and to reskill and to adapt. Um, and those resources would be both concrete resources like basic incomes um, and social safety net support mechanisms and social networks and things of that nature, <clears throat> but then also educational resources access to the pop-up classroom infrastructure um, and the time and skill sharing network of the distributed educational hub. So all of that, some of that sketched in the book as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was fascinating. And you kind of right at the end there, you touched upon this idea of this decentralized um, and, and this seemed to be a common thread in a few of the things you were saying, including what you were saying about more um, rebasing teaching on a more local level so that more of it happens on a community level um i'm curious if you're able to elaborate a bit more on how you might see so first of all maybe if you're able to summarize kind of what it is about decentralization in education that you think is so important in the current time and how you might see this play out um, and maybe even any examples you've seen, uh, not necessarily now, maybe more historically, or that you think are maybe good points of inspiration for people that may be looking at or trying to see new ways of designing these educational systems. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, decentralization is important, and there's, there's a bunch of problems with that word, but it is it ends up being a good word. But it's important in education for the same reason it's important in a lot of other areas of basic infrastructure. Um, so something to do with anti-fragility, something to do with resilience, um, and then the lessons learned about the fragility and lack of resilience in centralized systems. So the main reason now to do it has to do with the almost wholesale breakdown in teacherly authority from traditional channels. And this includes the media, but it also includes the schools with it, which have been in a legitimacy crisis for a while now. The idea is if the, the central, is, central locus of teacherly authority, which tries to transmit to the people what they should think and believe and how they should act, if that ceases to function, <laughs> but it's the only channel we have for intergenerational transmission, then we're in a lot of trouble. So the idea here is that we actually need to kind of like turn that centralized system off and reboot a whole bunch of local educational endeavors, which will get us back in truth with, excuse me, back in touch with truth and actual teacherly authority, right? So right now, a bunch of adolescents who give it up on school and who are being basically taught by social media, right? Uh, are in a position where they can be captured by advertisement as if it's teacherly authority. Um, what we need to do is set up at a community level these kinds of distributed educational networks that would allow an adolescent to fall into a relationship with someone who actually has teacherly authority and then they can experience it, right? Because the idea is if you're in an educational system that's really not working, then you've never experienced legitimate teacherly authority. Then you become... Uh, uh, basically cut off from the resources of your social system as a learner, right? It's not that you're a bad person. It's that you in a system that's not serving you. <laughs> and so you end up learning where you can, which ends up being just the internet or, or who knows what or nothing. Uh, and so there's this deeper issue that we're looking at now. It's like, how do we revivify the actual organic sources of teacherly authority so that people can begin to teach and learn again and it, it, this is wedded to the post-truth culture thing right it's wedded to the 2016 basically like nuking of the culture <laughs> if the american election which destroyed any semblance of publicly shared truth 
in the social field, right? And so to reestablish the means by which people can actually um, share in community and teacherly authority again, we need to a certain extent re-empower the community as a locus of teacherly authority, focused on concrete things within the community. <laughs> uh, um, and that, uh, so that's some of it, is that it's actually, it's a deep issue at the level of like curriculum and philosophy of education. It's like, no, we're actually in a crisis of teacherly authority. The only solution is to kind of like, in a sense, like return to the level at which it can be found um, and stop all of the intermediaries of the bureaucracy and the screen and all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, so that's one issue. And then the other issue is also just the, basically the impossibility of providing as diverse enough number of educational opportunities within something like a centralized building <laughs> that would be possible if you could make any room in the city, more or less, I mean, within reason, you could make any room in the city into a pop-up classroom, which is what the decentralized model holds, right? Um, so that's very interesting because much of what has been limiting modern schooling has been the form of schooling itself. Right. The idea that the kids need to be in a single building for six, seven hours a day, right? That they're bused to the one building, that the building needs to have these hot meals provided to the kids, right? So there's all of these stipulations of what modern schooling is, which means there's a bunch of stuff that you just can't do with kids if that's the stipulation of schooling, right? If there happen to be 50 kids in that urban high school who just want to learn about farming, well, maybe you just, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> right but if you just if you have a distributed thing where no you don't ever have to all spatially and temporarily spatio-temporally co-locate within a single physical building that's not a requisite anymore then a whole bunch of stuff opens up and it's not even like uh, the magic of the internet it's just simple architecture <laughs> you know and we decided long ago that we were going to centralize the schools now the last time we had a distributed thing like this is when we had something like the one room schoolhouse, right? Uh, these very early modern models where you had the textbooks and you had something like a structure that the schoolhouses were all networked to one another by the, by, uh, you know, by churches or by the state um, in America I'm talking about here. Um, but within the one room schoolhouse, you had a tremendous amount of flexibility and a very complex array of intergenerational transmission things going on. Um, uh, and so what we're looking for is like um, a model that kind of brings, uh, brings with it a certain new type of relationships, a new type of relationship between teacher and student, between student and student. Um, as different, again, as the factory school was from the one-room schoolhouse. <laughs> the one-room schoolhouse, everyone knew one another. Oh, Johnny's dad's got the cows or whatever, and he'll be late today. And this is, of course, completely stereotypical and not historically informed, uh, but it's more or less true. Now, of course, during that time, learning disabled students just simply didn't go to school, and neither did African Americans. And then by a certain point, women were not educated anymore. So there's all, I'm not saying like, let's go back to the one room schoolhouse, but I'm saying that there's a form there of locality and intimacy and uniqueness of locality, um, which is, uh, you know, in the book, I call it something like 21st century one room schoolhouse. Um, and there, in any given city, there'd be thousands of them, <laughs> you know, cause they'd be local neighbor, neighborhood level. Um, and, Again, some of this is predicated upon shifts in labor markets and things like basic incomes and reliable healthcare, things which would be the condition for the possibility of freeing parents from their traditional roles so that they could be more stewards of their children's education and participate with teachers more. Um, so, so that's a little bit more of, of, what I'm, of what I'm seeing. And as far as where it's happening, the interesting thing is that it's happening all over the place in the cracks, in the intertercities, in the in the spaces in between. Uh, you're seeing innovation almost entirely in this direction. 
Um, and then when the pandemic happened, a lot of these things became much more visible that there was already available this whole infrastructure that would allow kids to uh, remain connected to one another and do learning activities. Now, uh, yeah, so there's more to say on like specifics. I don't want to mention any particular groups or, or anything like that. But, you know, when I speak about these ideas of the decentralized educational hub network and the pop-up classrooms and, and uh, that kind of stuff, I usually get a lot of people telling me about projects that have shades of this that sound similar to it because it seems to be in the air. Again, I think it's the actual latent potential, the real potential of the digital is this. And so I think it's waiting to, waiting to happen. That's fantastic. And I mean, for me, time has just absolutely flown by. Um, I would, I, I think um, maybe just one point on that and, and especially to kind of tie kind of uh, bits of what you've been talking about there with maybe systems thinking more specifically, I mean, of course we are a systems thinking platform, um, that a lot of what you've been talking about, Zach, seems to be about, I mean, because in some ways it, it seems quite, you're talking about quite fundamental changes. Um, I mean, which is of course, you know, with incremental improvements can only go so far, especially when, you know, the real change that you need is, is much more transformative. And, you know, a lot of what you seem to be talking about is about changing kind of the underlying pattern of relationships um, in this exchange that um, that is part of the educational, I, I'm trying to say this, you know, in, a, in yeah. the most careful way, but it, you, it's, it's really kind of changing this pattern of relationships. And I, I think, and, and really one thing I just want to stress as well for people that are listening today, obviously we, we covered a lot of, you know, different areas in, in, in kind of short space of time, but you know, if you're interested in these ideas, I really re recommend you, you read Zach's book or his other blog articles because he, he really goes into much more depth into these ideas. Um, but I would love now to, to, to uh, take a bit of uh, time to, to answer the questions that we've had. So thanks everyone for their engagement. And so uh, the first question, so you mentioned um, Zach about life, lo lifelong learning and how, you know, this whole idea of education, life, starts when education ends and this kind of separation and it's kind of a bit ridiculous in some ways but how do we continue to cultivate you know these ideals of lifelong learning and an intrinsic drive for knowledge and contribution i mean i think there's a few things to say there it's a great question um you know one is early experiences with learning that one of the most important ways to foster lifelong learning is to make it clear at a young age that learning and schooling are not the same. <laughs> like, because I think people become disabled uh, by certain forms of schooling. They become disabled in their capacity to learn. So like, if you look at a young child learning to walk, right? Uh, this is actually very difficult learning to walk this is an example that Theo Dawson, my mentor gave a lot and, uh, and they'll hurt themselves. They'll fall over learning to walk. Right. But they'll keep get up and doing learning to walk and the parent will instinctively grab the arms and guide the child. And so there's just this natural teacherly authority of the adult teaching that. So there's just this great, right. It's not a state mandated curriculum, right. It's not a state certified teacher teaching the kid to walk, right. The kid's just learning to walk. This is, anthropologically deep-seated species specific trait actually this kind of teaching and learning and uh and but there's a joy in the child in the learning to walk and in learning to speak um, and a willingness to really struggle in fact to onboard that capacity to build that skill um, and but at certain points along the as kids get older the love of learning, what I think is actually an instinctual love of learning uh, and the instinctual desire to get into a teacher student relationship, the instinctual desire to like fall into the dynamics of teacherly authority and the pleasure that comes from that uh, becomes confused and painful because schooling is uh, suboptimal to say the least. Um, and so I think one of the main things that needs to happen to assure lifelong learning is that people love learning. 
again, very simple. <laughs> but if you're, if most of your experience of like learning, quote unquote, is what happens in school when you're cramming for tests, and it's usually painful and it's irrelevant, you don't understand exactly what you're doing. It's because of extrinsic reward, because um, you have to. You don't really care. You're not that interested or curious. Uh, that's not learning. And they, but you think that's learning, and so then you don't realize that there's this thing that you could fall in love with, which is, you know, learning. So that's the main thing. It's actually, it's a, it's a disposition that needs to be fostered. And it comes from having really vibrant, positive experiences of learning, usually self-directed learning at some point at a fairly young age, if possible. Yeah. Fascinating. So it's almost like you're alluding to almost like a self-reinforcing loop that when you learn something through kind of like the intrinsic uh, you know, motivation and you see it pay off and it kind of leads you know, you, you kind of want to discover more and it starts to become kind of like this playground. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and maybe time just for uh, just for one, one last question. Um, so um, this question I think is very kind of relevant today, um, you know, about kind of, you know, equity and, and kind of, I guess, inequality in education. And um, so it's, the question is that modern schools were working um, only in the US global north the global south was always bearing the brunt of this growth. How can we ensure not just bettering education, um, keeping equity in mind, essentially? Mm. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and you remember I mentioned Emmanuel Wallerstein's world system analysis, and part of his theory there with world system transformation is that the modern capitalist world system is predicated upon this model of a core and a periphery. And the core is something like the gated West, the first world West, and the, and the periphery is something like the, you know, what we used to call the third world, or we now sometimes call the global South. And that the whole thing works on that dynamic, unfortunately, that there's a core and there's a periphery, and that the core externalizes costs and dangers and other things out of the core and into the periphery. And so that there's this, like in the Hegelian master slave dynamic on a global scale playing out. Um, so first, absolutely correct <laughs> like there has been a uh, completely asymmetric relationship between the global north and the global south and that's played out with the exporting from the north to those peripheries uh, of the worst of our practices of modern schooling um, uh, which is to say that you know when you look at how modern schooling began and like the kind of classical american school systems and the french and all of that stuff like uh, and then you look at the way those systems end up being kind of like copied or actually enforced or forced upon uh, different regions of the world through uh, World Bank uh, sponsored uh, global educational reform initiatives. Um, you see the worst of human capital theory kind of exported from the North to the South. Now, my only concern with the question is that to say that the schools are working in the core is, act, is in, in, from one perspective, completely true. But there's a way that these schools have also really failed, right? I mean, like the whole world's been bring, brought to the brink of self-termination as a result of a uh, uh, kind of um, a cultural ethos that has pushed so far beyond the limits of growth and sustainability and reasonableness that we're facing catastrophe. So those schools also failed. <laughs> they just failed in a, in a different way um, than, the, than the schools that kind of like were spawned and spread out around the world. Um, that said, my hope is that it's precisely in, in the periphery, and this is Wallerstein's uh, hypothesis too, that it's precisely in the periphery where you'll actually get the innovations that allow the whole thing to flip. Um, and uh, you know, it would actually be easier in some cases to do one of the, one of the kind of the notion that I've suggested of the decentralized educational hub in a place that didn't already have a long history of legacy, big, huge school systems. Um, you know, like in places in Africa where they went directly from having no phones to having cell phones, as opposed to laying down a bunch of phone lines to put in like the ground phones, which we have in the West, so that you can do leapfrogging over unnecessary infrastructural rollouts. So I could imagine some of the greatest educational innovations coming precisely in, in the periphery and on mass. Um, but that's a hopeful future, but it's hard to know exactly what will happen. <laughs>
Yeah, that's fascinating. And it kind of almost uh, kind of emphasizes as well that, you know, when we are looking for maybe, as you say, these fringe, um, you know, pockets of innovation that we're really casting the net wide and we're not just kind of maybe staying within our bubble and saying, oh, well, no innovation's happening here, but really kind of branching out and, and for sources of, of inspiration. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm aware we're, we're, we're out of time, but um, yeah, I'm yeah, curious, yeah. Uh, Mikhail, uh, yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, okay, I appreciate you have to go now, but thank you so much, Zach. And as, as I say to, to all the, the audience as well, do check out Zach's stuff if you're, if you're interested in the topics that we, the things that we discussed today. And Mikhail, did you have any final uh, words that you wanted to share or Zach? Oh, thanks a lot to Zach. And uh, one, one question that would have been really, really interesting to have a discussion, but we're running out of time, is, is actually the relationship of how, how systems thinking to, to the type of uh, developmental sta states that we would need to you know, operate in this type of world, which is, uh, which is uh, outlined in the limits of the growth. I think, I think um, there is something a lot in systems thinking that people, have, uh, people who are in, in, interested in, in that um, learn learn about how to you know expand their thinking to uh, mm. incorporate a lot of different di disciplines and uh, trying to learn over them and you know connect connect experiences in, in life to things you read in books and you know all of that type of stuff. Mm. Totally, yeah. We'll get to that next time. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, and uh, and yeah, thanks for your time, Zach. This is a, this is a real pleasure. Thank you. Totally. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you later. Thanks. Thanks, Zach. Thank you.